so it's been quite a while. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I'm curious about that I hope you don't mind talking about this is uh, I've always thought that, gosh, this guy negotiated. You worked for long-term capital and negotiated their $3.6 billion sort of rescue deal as general counsel. And I thought, you know, you have to have come away from that with so- something, you know, that you sort of learned about the world that you'll mm, maybe I'll never do that again or I'll do it differently next time or something. Am I right? No? Yes and no. Uh, it, it starts with my role. I was the general counsel. I was the lawyer. I had other responsibilities, you know, external relations and compliance and all that stuff. But in this capacity, I was the chief lawyer. Um, and, you know, you never do everything alone. We had outside law firms. Uh, we actually had two outside law firms because we had the management company, um, you know, which we all worked for and we charged fees and made money and all that. Then we had the fund, which is where the money was that actually did the trading. And a lot of people don't understand this about hedge fund structures or even for that matter, you know, private equity fund structures. The management company and the fund are two different legal entities. And, and when I say fund, we had, I think, 14, 14 funds, you know, with what's called a master feeder structure. And you have separate funds for Japan and, and so on and so forth. Um, normally, there's no conflict. You're trying to make as much money as possible. The investors want you to make as much money as possible and everything's fine. But in a distress or meltdown situation, there can be conflicts. Uh, what's good for the partners may or may not be good for the investors. Um, and so I was in the middle no matter what. I was, I was general counsel of the whole thing. But what we did, I hired one major law firm to represent the management company and one major law firm to represent the fund. And that way we were getting legal advice that was uh, not conflicted. If you were working for the fund, you were just working for the fund. Uh, and that solved that problem. I, I was in the middle no matter what, so I, there, was, there was no way around that and everyone knew that. But so that was, that was one thing we did to kind of address that conflict. But um, as a lawyer, uh, I mean, I, this was 1998. I graduated from law school in 1977. So it was 21 years as a professional. Uh, I had worked for investment banks. I had worked for the biggest bank in the world at the time, which was Citibank. Uh, I had a lot of experience. I traveled all over the world. So I was kind of, you know, at that, at that point, you're, you know, I guess 47 or whatever, you're at the height of your career. It doesn't mean your career is over. I've done a lot of things since. But um, it's, it's, as a lawyer, it's, it's kind of as good as it gets. You've got enough seasoning to know what you're doing and enough energy to do it, uh, you know, going days without sleep, which is what we did. So, uh, and we came out of it without a scratch. Now, that sounds amazing. But in fact, um, there were no... There was no wrongdoing. There never was, uh, but you know, it was investigated. The CFTC, the SEC, um, state securities regulators, Cayman Islands securities. Re- everyone looked into it. Uh, the Italian government was in an uproar, et cetera, because uh, we were the biggest traders in Italian government bonds. But they all came away saying, "Okay, you guys lost a lot of money. It was a near, uh, um, you know, global global earthquake, which it would have been if we had not been able to." close the deal, but nobody did anything wrong. It was just, it was just bad risk management, but that wasn't the risk management. Wasn't my responsibility. My responsibility was the legal. We came through it fine. There were no enforcement actions, no lawsuits. In fact, um, the principals went on to make fortunes. They were, they were smart guys. Uh, a, a, one group just lifted up the entire back office, moved, one town closer to New York from kind of Greenwich, Connecticut to Harrison, New York, if you know that it part of Westchester and started Globo, uh, which became one of the largest uh, fund administrators in the world. And they were later bought out by SS&C Technologies for I think a billion dollars or more. So those guys, you know, the former LTCM guys went out and made a billion dollars as hedge fund administrators, which was, you know, smart, smart business model. So, uh, you know, and in different ways, you know, Bob Merton is still a, uh, a university professor at Harvard today, Mama Scholes and Bob shared the Nobel Prize. Uh, you know, so everyone got back on their feet. Everyone did well. Everyone came out of it without a scratch. So my view of what I did as a lawyer was that uh, 
I did my job. I, I you know, bought the thing. You know, it was four engines on fire. We brought the thing in for a soft landing. We were hours away from shutting every securities market in the world. That didn't happen because uh, we got the deal done. It was not easy. I, I don't want to get into you know, personal confidences, but, you know, some partners are like, where do I sign? Other partners were in tears and other partners were what's in it for me. And, you know, so I had to, at some point, the personal link rather than the legal uh, link became critical. I had to go one by one and sit down with them and we, we got it done. So as a lawyer, yeah, yeah it was kind of, you know, my, uh, I don't know, a D-Day or whatever you want to call it. And I was, um, uh, it was very successful. We got the deal done. The world did not come to an end. Everyone got back on their feet. But to your point, um, I came out of it very, very dissatisfied with the risk management. That wasn't my responsibility, but I said, wait a second. We've got two Nobel Prize winners. We've got a, a raft of Harvard, MIT, Chicago, PhDs in applied mathematics, uh, um, economics, um, you know, et cetera, a great staff. You didn't get hired at LTCM unless, you know, 11 partners agreed that you were the best out there. So that, that's how you got in the door. Um, so, and I started hearing things, you know, talking, I, I stayed around for a year. I mean, I, my, my view was when you blow up the chemistry lab, you're supposed to clean it up before you go to your next class. Uh, so I stayed for a year until August of 99. By that point, it was clear it was in liquidation. Everything was under control and people could begin to move on, which I did. But um, but during that year, you know, it was the same partners, mostly the same staff com coming into the office every day. And I started to hear things like uh, this was a 15 standard deviation event. Uh, this the odds of this happening are like one in three billion, or it couldn't have happened since the beginning of the universe. And I thought to myself, well, it must have been a really bad day for us if, uh, that's, if those were the odds. But I, I, I quickly realized that they were using um, a what's called a normal distribution, also a Gaussian distribution, better probably better known as the bell curve, but that was their model of how risk uh, risky events occurred and third you know three four five ten standard deviations is a statistical um metric basically describing how far out the curve are you you know the curve comes down to the x-axis which if you hit the x-axis there's a zero probability but even but but you know 15 standard deviations is like way out on the curve and practically never happens so i said to myself well those models cannot be correct. That cannot be the way risk operates because these things don't happen every 3 billion years. They happen every seven or eight years. Um, you know, the <laughs> stock, October 19th, 1987, stock market goes down 22% in one day. I mean, that would be the equivalent of what, uh, a 6,000 uh, 6, point on the Dow, a 6,000 point drop on the Dow today, not 600, 6,000 in one day. Um, and I've just, I've been a magnet for trouble. I mean, my, I was around for the, uh, the 1974 Hearst-Dot Bank crisis, uh, the 1994 tequila crisis, uh, the SNL crisis, the, uh, the 87 <laughs> stock market crash. Um, you've seen your you share know, of this stuff. Well, more than my share. I, I've, it's hard to think. <laughs> yeah, of you've seen my been, share and your share and everybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> involved in one, one directly or indirectly. Because I, mean, I worked at I worked at Citibank and I worked at investment banks and hedge funds. So you're on the front rows of, of all this stuff, right. not to mention, you know, 2008 and, and more. Um, but uh, so I'm like, okay, well, I know they happen every seven or eight years. Just look at, look at the history books, look at the calendar, go back as far as you want. And these models say that it happens every, you know, 1 billion years. So obviously the model's wrong. Uh, so that, that part of it was easy, but relatively easy. But then I said, okay, well, if that doesn't work, if those models don't work, if those models are not the way to match risk, what does work? So I set out, I continued as a lawyer. It was not long after that, that 9-11 happened. And I was tapped by the CIA to help them with financial warfare. And I worked for the CIA for about 10 years doing that, but I, you know, I could do other things as well, where they were complimentary and I, uh, began a systematic investigation. So I had to kind of dust off the math textbooks and delve into everything from behavioral psychology to complexity theory, which, uh, I, I was one of the, I didn't invent complexity theory that was invented around 1960. I mean, it's been around since the creation of the universe. That was a complex dynamic system, but, uh, there was in, in 1960, 
uh, that a scientist named Edward Lorenz, happened to be working on, on climatology, by the way, um, uh, noticed some things that led him to describe complexity theory very well. And complexity theory has been used in physics, uh, biology, uh, um, all kinds of dynamic systems, uh, you know, rocket engines, turbulence, you name it. It was never applied to finance, and that was a, a field just waiting to happen. So I was one of the pioneers, not the only one, but one of the first, to, to take this whole body of complexity theory over here, bring it over to capital markets, and see if it worked. And the answer is it did work. In fact, in terms of predictive power, describing the, the operation of the system, um, understanding risk, it worked perfectly, and it was a short leap to say, well, okay, the capital markets are a complex dynamic system. So complexity theory is going to help you, not just help you, but it's the best way to model financial risk. And the predictive value is huge compared to all these other models that just don't work. So, um, so I, I, and I used that, you know, at the CIA, we used it to predict terrorist attacks. We had some success with that. We built a working prototype, um, um, a model that, you know, basically a, an engine, if, you know, analytical engine, if you will. Uh, and it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't just complexity theory, it was Bayes' theorem, um, it was uh, behavioral psychology, history. We were able to create a neural network using all those uh, fields, uh, combining them in our predictive analytic models that work very well. And I continue to use them. I, I still do it today. So as a lawyer, I felt that I couldn't have done any better but as an analyst, I felt that a whole new field had opened up. And sure, I learned an enormous amount, of it, but mostly self-taught. You, you had to teach yourself because there was no one else teaching it. So, so yeah, you reach out to experts, but that's, that, was, that was the big uh, learning experience for me. All right. Well, thank you for that. I really, uh, it's a fascinating episode. We all learned a lot from it. And hearing from somebody on the inside is just really valuable. 